Okay, so hi, hi everybody. My name is Bande Sajato, and I'm here for the uh, afternoon meditation. And for this afternoon, uh, let's do some uh, metta meditation. So I'm going to talk about metta meditation for about 15 minutes or so, and then we can do some practice together. Just before we start, can, has, everyone here has meditated before, is that right? Do we have anyone who's new to meditation? No, everyone's meditated before. That's good. And uh, just before we start also, is there anybody here who is a uh, completely accomplished meditation master? No? <laughs> okay, that's good. So we're somewhere in between. We've started and we haven't finished. So we're somewhere on the road. You know what they say, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. That's what they say in China. If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Why is that? It's because the Buddha isn't on the road. The Buddha is on the end of the road. He's already finished. The rest of us are on the journey. So whoever we meet on the road, it's not the Buddha. It's someone else. Anyway, so we're going to do some uh, metta meditation, which does not involve killing Buddhas or anybody else. <laughs> and... It's a very nice cooling meditation for a hot day. Actually, a good practice if you feel like the heat is too much to bear, uh, a good practice is to go and uh, get really, really angry. You can try, you can try, uh, you know, getting into some road rage or getting into some really furious discussions. You get 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 outraged over the fact that somebody on the internet is wrong and correct them. And then when you get really angry, then you can look inside yourself and realize this is actually so much worse than the heat outside. <laughs> and then after that you realize, hey, oh, the heat, the heat outside isn't too bad after all. So if you've got that contentment inside, then whatever happens outside, never mind. Not such a big deal. And so much of the frustration we have is because it comes from a sense of control, a sense of wanting uh, to make sure things go our way. And I think it is something that's very observable in, in human culture is that the better we get at controlling things, the better we get at uh, getting things when we want. then the more upset we get with everything. We expect everything to go our way. We expect things to be on time. We expect things to go quickly and efficiently. And if you live for a while in countries where things don't go quickly and efficiently, if you try driving around in the traffic in Benares, for example, or you try getting something done in bureaucracy in, in many countries. Or just try to get people to have a, have a kind of a sense of getting a job done on time. It can be quite hard. And you realize that the less expectations you have about things, the more contentment you have, then the easier it is to not feel angry and frustrated by things. So if we want to develop metta meditation, the most important thing, the single most important thing that we can do to support our practice is to develop patience. To develop contentment. Just that sense of, it's okay. I can wait. Never mind, you go first.
Just having that sense of patience. And if we can have that, bring that sense into our meditation, that's what they call letting go. And any kind of meditation we do will be will go smoothly. But especially the meditation on metta and loving kindness. How many times do we get angry or annoyed because somebody doesn't live up to our expectations? I ordered this meal half an hour ago and still hasn't been haven't been served. The light, the light went green ten seconds ago, and they're still sitting there. What are they doing? Well, we get frustrated with ourselves, and angry with ourselves, because we're not, we don't get things right. We're supposed to do something at work, and we make a mistake. And so all that sense of uh, anger builds up. The sense of things never being quite right, never being good enough. And that's what we carry around with us as stress and tension inside our body. And then when we come to meditate, we bring that same attitude into the meditation trying to push it, trying to control it, trying to make it into something that it's not. But actually the meditation is just this. Meditation is the easiest thing in the world. There's nothing to it. You just sit there. That's all. So when we, we teach meditation, we have a method of meditation. And the method of meditation has one very important purpose. And it has the purpose of tricking you into thinking that you've got something to do. Because if you were just to sit there and let go, you'd be like, what, 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 what's that? What am I doing? What's letting go? So we give you a meditation method. And meditation method, all it is, is a set of uh, guidelines whose purpose is to help you to let go a little bit by little bit. But actually, if you know how to let go, you don't even need a meditation method. You just sit down and let go. But for most of us, that's quite scary. So we need to let go a little bit at a time. And that's why, in, if you look carefully and reflect on any uh, of the good meditation methods that are around there, you'll see that they always have that kind of very um, uh, very gentle and very gradual sense of letting go bit by bit to them. And that's the metta, metta, metta meditation method that I'm going to teach has that kind of um, aspect to it as well. So in, the, in this method we have a series of four uh, stages that we develop loving kindness for. And we're not going to do all four of those this afternoon. But those four people are, first of all, oneself, secondly, a loved person, thirdly, a neutral person, and fourthly, a disliked person. So for this afternoon, let's do the first three of those stages. Oneself, a loved person, and a neutral person. And we're going to develop loving kindness for each one of those in turn. When we're able to do that and develop loving kindness for all four of those people in turn, that means it, that's evenly, completely evenly, then we can develop loving kindness for all beings. Sabbe sata bhavantu sukitata. And that's like a huge letting go.
So we let go into this practice a little bit by little bit. So when we develop loving kindness for ourselves, we let go of any doubts that we might have. We let go of any sense of lack of self-worth or self-esteem. We let go so that we can accept ourselves and love ourselves fully and completely and without any reservation. And then we do the next stage meditation for the loved person. And for that loved person, we choose somebody who it's easy for us to love. Not necessarily somebody who we love very deeply. It's more important that we choose somebody who we love very simply. So somebody like a grandparent or a grandchild, someone like that is usually good. Someone we love very simply and very purely. And when we love that loved one in that way, we're letting go of any sense of um, any sense of attachment in our in the way that we love. Normally, we love somebody because they make us feel good. But here, we don't worry about that. We're not trying to get anything out of it. We're not loving them because they make us feel good. We're just loving them for the sake of loving them. And then the third person is a neutral person. And here we let go of that sense of indifference, of not caring about strangers, about others. And we choose for that somebody who uh, we don't have any strong feelings for or against. Somebody... Uh, for example, like someone you might meet down here at the Buddhist Society or somebody at work perhaps. Somebody who's, um, you know their name and you know them well enough to say hi and so on, but not all well enough to sort of really like them or dislike them. Someone who you're fairly neutral about. So I want you to choose somebody in each of these categories. So choose somebody in the self category. Usually there's only one in that. If there's more than one, then you can choose which one of yourselves to love. Uh, in the loved person category, and one person in the neutral category. Okay, So usually there's about 7 billion people in the neutral category, and you just have to choose one of them. All right? Later on, we can develop meta for the other 7 billion. Okay? But for now, just one. So we do it gradually. So if you, if you choose those people now, and then we'll start the meditation, and as the meditation progresses, we'll, we'll develop metta for each one of those uh, three people. Okay, so let's start the practice, and we'll meditate for about 45 minutes. When we first come to meditate, we sit in a way that's reasonably comfortable, reasonably alert.
Settling back into the moment, settling back into the body. Bringing a sense of ease, allowing the, the tensions and the harsh places to just just relax. Whenever your mind starts to think about this and that, cut through the stream of thought. Don't be interested in the thinking. Don't give it importance. Just say to yourself, thinking, thinking, thinking. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Noticing any feelings and emotions that you're bringing into the meditation. Feelings of happiness or sadness. Expectation or fear, worry or anxiety, peacefulness and joy. Any of these feelings, just hold them gently in the mind. Look at them and then let them go. Just be the one who watches. Don't, don't keep staring at them very hard. Don't try to analyze them. Don't try to make them go away. Just notice them for a minute. Oh, okay, that's how it is. And then step back from them. Let them be. Don't be part of them. Don't get caught up in them. Just be the one who sits in the middle 
and watches. And when the mind feels reasonably still, you say to oneself the words, may I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy. Saying those words evenly, steadily, easily. making a secure foundation for the mind. Don't worry about the noises outside. Don't worry about any thoughts. Don't worry about any doubts. Just keep bringing up that feeling those words again and again and again. May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be happy.
And as we continue with those words of metta, notice that along with the words is something else, something deeper than the words. And that's the feeling of metta. It's a soft, gentle feeling, like a warm glow. A little bit like the radiance you see around a candle flame. See if you can find that feeling. It's there somewhere. Maybe you don't notice it. Maybe you can't tune into that frequency yet. But it's there in everybody. It's that feeling of love. Fleeting, weak it may be, but still there, still a light. Catch that feeling in your mind and keep it close. Keeping awareness focused on the feeling of metta inside your body while you continue with the words may I be happy may I be happy may I be happy
May I be happy. May I be happy. May I be happy. Letting the feeling soak through your whole body. Every cell, every part of your body. Filled with beautiful, joyful, loving-kindness. Now moving to the second stage, to metta for a loved person. Now keep your mind just as it is. Don't go over there to where the loved one is. Keeping awareness focused inside your body.
and just bring the name of that loved person into the words of metta. May that loved one be happy. May that loved one be happy. May they be happy. May they be happy. May they be happy.
Now moving to the third stage, is loving kindness for the neutral person. Again, keeping the mind just as it is and bringing the name of that neutral person into the words of metta. May they be happy. May they be happy. May they be happy. Applying oneself carefully with enthusiasm and interest. Bringing joy and life to the meditation. May they be happy. May they be happy. May they be happy.
kindly taking that same metta and spreading it out to all beings. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. Without measure, without limit, making no distinctions whatsoever. Letting the mind radiate out across the whole world. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings be happy. And finally, we're coming near the end of the meditation, back from all beings to that neutral person. May they be happy. May they be happy. May they be happy. And then to the loved one, may they be happy. May they be happy. May they be happy. to oneself, may I be happy, may I be happy, may I be happy, letting the words of metta go, letting the feeling of metta fade away, and allowing the mind to return to a neutral space, empty, open and clear.
And with the mind empty and clear, let's take a minute to reflect back over the practice we've just done together, inquiring into cause and effect. What just happened? How did that meditation feel? Was I able to do the meditation technique? What changed during the meditation? How is my mind different now to how it was before? And finally, we can dedicate the merit of our practice. May all beings be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings finally realize Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You can open your eyes and come out of meditation. Okay, so I've got a few questions here. So uh, we have Nelu from Romania. And all the way from Romania, he's saying, well, when I talked about killing the Buddha, then how can I let go of the image of killing from my mind? That word generates in my mind the image of violent, violent killing. Um, well, I'm sorry for that. It wasn't, it wasn't my intention. It's just a uh, ancient Buddhist saying, so it just came to my mind at that time. So uh, the idea is that there's a, a, a what, what tends to happen in meditation is that um, we, we as we're practicing that various kinds of uh, 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 delusions present themselves to our mind and they often take very appealing forms and one of the most appealing forms that those delusions take is they take the form of enlightenment so they tell us, you're special, you're enlightened, yeah? you're the one. And sometimes this can be very literally in the form of a Buddha who might appear to you in the meditation and actually say these things to you. And so these are things that actually happens to people in their practice. And so the, uh, uh, this is why that advice is there. And the reason why the advice sounds a bit uh, stern uh, is because that, when that happens to you in your practice, it's very tempting, it's very, it's very seductive. And so you have to be very kind of de decisive with that kind of thing. As soon as that thought comes, I'm enlightened, well, there's an I there, isn't there? I'm the one who the Buddha has come to speak to. So just get rid of it. Actually, even though uh, the Buddha usually used very uh, gentle and very soft language. Even he would use quite uh, rough language sometimes. There's one time when he was talking to a horse trainer about training horses and uh, he said that, that the, uh, uh, the horse trainer asked him how he trains the monks. And the Buddha asked him, well, how do you train your horses? And he says, well, I train them by keeping on trying again and again and whenever they do something wrong, I try to get them to do something and get, do it right. And he says, but what happens at the end of the day if they're just rebellious and never do anything right? And the horse trainer says, well, well, then I kill them. I kill the horse. And the Buddha said, well, that's what I do with my monks. <laughs> the horse trainer says, what? You kill your monks? And the Buddha says, well, not literally. It means that you give up on them. You don't try to train them anymore if they're not going to be trainable. 
Anyway, so I do apologize if that uh, uh, imagery was too, too harsh for you. Okay, so Adrian, also from Romania. Hello to everybody from Romania today. Is the feeling of meta something that is unchanging or something that fluctuates, something like a, rather than, like a symphony rather than one tone? That's quite uh, an, an interesting question. Actually, it's a bit of both. Normally, uh, in, your, um, uh, in your mind and in your body, when we feel emotions, we feel they are definitely something that changes, aren't they? It's like a kind of surging ocean or like the flowing of the river, and we feel these things changing all the time. And so one of the things that we try to do in our meditation is to develop them in a way that's more stable and more reliable. But of course we don't do that by sort of making them fixed, right? So it's not about sort of catching one emotion and just making it stay without changing. But it's about developing the mind in a way such that the mind is so content and so happy to be just in that place with that feeling that it, it doesn't want to change, it doesn't want to go anywhere, it just wants to dwell in that place with that feeling. And I'm thinking about it now uh, here here in, in Perth today, I think it's 42, is that right? 42 today? It's one of those days in Perth summer when you, you walk outside and you stand in the sun and I did that just at midday just to sort of feel it and you feel this kind of like walking into an oven and this kind of oppressive weight of heat <laughs> pushing down on you. And, uh, you know, if, it's, if the day is really hot like that, then, you know, to, to imagine the thought of when the evening comes and you could sit beside the beach or beside a river and just with the cool water and just watching the waves coming in and going out. And if you were just to sit like that at the end of a hot day, it would just be so cool and so easeful and so, so calming that you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And so the deeper that you go into the meditation and the, the more that the metta is developed, then the more it becomes just like one tone, one, one flavor that the loving kindness has. So in a sense, you can, you can think of that if you want to continue the uh, uh, musical analogy that was given in the question there. It's like when, you, when you're going through a, a symphony and then you come to the end and it just resolves itself into one tone at the end. But that one tone is so beautiful that you just want to keep staying there. Okay, so a uh, question from Oshi from Perth. There's a stiffness in my head when I meditate. Should I do anything about this? Stiffness in your head. Well... Uh, Without knowing more about it, it's a bit difficult to say absolutely, but it sounds like uh, usually when that kind of thing happens, it comes because you're probably pushing a bit too hard and trying a bit too hard. So that's when we get this kind of sense of compression or pressure inside our head. So I can't say 100% that's what's happening with you, but most likely it's something like that. So generally speaking, if that happens, just relax back off from the meditation, don't even try, to give, give it a go with your meditation where you don't even try to do any meditation technique. So you don't sit down and think I'm going to watch my breath or I'm going to develop metta or anything like that, just, just sit. I'm not going to do anything. If your mind thinks, well, let it think. Whatever, mind wanders, don't try to stop it, don't try to do anything. Just, just, be, just let the mind completely relax. And try sitting like that every so often. So you really get that feeling for what it's like just to relax and just to not, not judge and not worry about where your mind is. And then gradually try to bring that feeling into the more structured meditation so that you can, you, you need to ultimately get that balance where you're, you're completely uh, focused and completely um, uh, sh sharp and clear on the meditation object, but at the same time completely letting go. So if you find that your the balance is shifting one way or the other, that it's too pushing too much, then you need to practice with just letting go. On the other hand, if you find that it's going the other way, if your mind's just too sloppy and too sleepy, then you need to try firming up a little bit, being a bit more sharp in your in the way that you're approaching the meditation.
So when you're just doing that method of sitting and letting go, what is the anchor of coming back? There is none. There isn't none. So you just the anchor's holding on to something. You're just on the ocean. Let the currents take you where they will. Okay, thank you. You just do it for a while, yeah? And uh, well, one of the things that that does uh, is that it teaches you that it's kind of okay. You know, it's not the end of the world. You know, maybe you're not going to get very concentrated or very focused in that particular session. But if, if, if that's your problem, if your problem is that your mind is getting too tight and too tense, you're not going to get properly focused or concentrated anyway. So your lesson that you have to learn is to how to let go. And then you learn, well, it's all right. The mind is just a mind. Thoughts are just thoughts. Emotions are just emotions. They're okay. Let them come, let them go. One of the biggest problems, I think, I think really probably the, the single biggest problem that we have in meditation is that we, we make our own mind into the enemy. How can I overcome thoughts? Yeah, Think about what it means to want to overcome thoughts. You don't overcome your friends. right? How can I get rid of my loved ones? That's not a thought that occurs to you very often, is it? You get rid of your enemies. So we think, we think of our thoughts and our own feelings as being our enemies, something we need to get rid of. Yeah. So that's not the most promising attitude to have to our own mind, is it? So we think we recognize our own mind is our family. It's the ones that we love. And just like the ones that we love and like our family, a lot of the time it's kind of annoying, right? That's just how life is. But we don't think we want to get rid of it. We think, how do we, how do we quiet it? How do we make those thoughts, how do we make the mind so content and happy that it doesn't want to think? Yeah? So one way you can think about it is that, that, that in your mind is like uh, a bunch of little children in a room. So if you want the little children to be quiet, what do you do? Tell them, sit down and shut up? That's going to work, right? <laughs> No, you don't. You give them one of these <laughs> or something, something that they're going to play around with, maybe some plasticine or some finger paint or something. You give them something that they're going to enjoy doing and then they're going to get interested in doing that and then they're not going to be wanting to run around and make a noise. So it's the same thing with your mind. You don't try to make the mind be quiet, but you give your mind something which is going to enjoy doing. You're moving towards that, yeah. So if when I was talking about that, that practice of just, just completely letting go, in that case, yes, you wouldn't do anything. Yeah. So you just let the mind do whatever it wants. But then when you feel that that's relaxed and you got that sense, then you bring that object in in that way that's going to direct it, yeah. Actually, you find it even in the, the Satipatthana Sutta, Satipatthana Sangyutta. Uh, it talks about that. There's one very interesting sutra. It talks about developing satipatthana or developing mindfulness meditation in a way that's both directed and undirected. Yeah. So there's there's these two kind of modes that you can approach. But each, but the interesting. I won't go into detail into that sutra. It's a very interesting one. But the interesting thing about it is that that that's very pragmatic. That that the undirected meditation has its purpose, and the directed meditation has its purpose. So that we use that for what to accomplish what it needs to accomplish. Okay. Moving on. Okay, so last night, if I heard you correctly, you said that if you let go of the I, then one does not make any more good or bad karma. Could you kindly elaborate further on this statement? Oh, that's really excellent. Somebody actually heard what I was saying last night. That's really, that's very reassuring. Thank you so much. It's wonderful having you in Perth once again. Okay, so... Uh, so yes, this is uh, uh, some. I can't remember exactly what it is that I said last night, but I do remember saying something along those general lines. So the basic idea—it's a very, it's quite a subtle point actually. But when we talk about karma, karma uh, as as uh, intention or volition, 
uh, as I was talking about last night, is essentially means what is the, the moral choices that we make. Okay, a choice to do good or a choice to do bad, or an indifferent choice. So as the, at that, that moral choice, the thing that the Buddha pointed out is that choice has an energy to it. And that energy is something that, that you can feel, actually, can't you? You, you can actually feel when you, when, you, when you do the right thing, you can feel that has an energy to it, and you can feel that that energy has a result. It makes you feel in a certain way. And, it, and if you continue to make those right choices, it shapes your life in a certain direction. And similarly, with, uh, if you make bad karma, then it makes you feel bad, gives you a sense of remorse. And if you continue to make bad choices, then it leads your life in that bad direction. So karma is energy. That's actually what the word karma means. It literally means action or work or energy. So so we do a good karma or a bad karma and then we experience the results of that. But why is it that I experience the results of my karma and not the results of your karma? <laughs> right? The Buddha said, Kama Sakomi, we are the owners of our karma. And the reason why we're the owners of our karma is, is, is largely because of the fact that we attach to it, we identify with it. We think of it as mine. And again, that's something that, that you can experience very easily if you do a bad uh, deed, then you feel remorseful because you think, I did that bad deed, right? Let's say you, you got angry at somebody in the shop and yelled at them because they didn't give you what you wanted and you were frustrated and hurrying. So you yelled at them and then afterwards you said, oh, that was really nasty of me. I shouldn't have yelled at that poor person who was just trying to do their job. Right? So you feel remorseful. Well, you wouldn't feel remorseful if, if somebody else had, had yelled, right? You feel remorseful because it's what you did. And you imagine it, that if, 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 you're, if you didn't feel any sense of identity with that act, right? So if you felt that that, if you felt towards that act the same way as you feel towards if somebody else does something, then you wouldn't be attaching to that karma and you wouldn't be identifying with it in the same way. So when we, when, when we perform an action, it, the, 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 the power or the potency of that action, over time it just it, it kind of dissipates itself. It only has a certain degree of, of um, energy to it. Each choice only has a certain energy to it. And that, just dis and that dissipates over time. But because we hold on to it, every time we think about it, every time we grab hold of it, every time we remember it, we're reinforcing it and building it up and reminding ourselves of it again and again and again and again. And so this is how that karma kind of builds up, how we hold on to it. So if we let go of that sense of I and that sense of self, then that karma basically pretty much just, just dissolves and fades away. It might still have some kind of minor echoes. Yeah? It's just natural that it sort of echoes as from its own natural force in our life for a little while. Uh, it doesn't completely disappear all at once. But because we're not holding it, we're not uh, building and sustaining that force of that karma. So the classic example of that was the, the case of uh, Angulimala, who was uh, one of the Buddha's um, students who was a serial killer. And he had murdered many people until he was converted, became a monk, and uh, became enlightened. And then one day he worked, uh, walked into the village and they threw rocks at him. And he came back with his head bleeding. And the Buddha said, well, just deal with it. <laughs> That's actually what he said, just deal with it. And he said, you know, you, you, if, if you... Uh, uh, that's that, that that kind of karma would have that you've made would have if you'd still attached to it that would have been resulted in uh, a lot of pain and suffering for you for a long time. Um, but as it is, because if you let go of it, then that's all that's left is just that little bit of pain. Okay. Another question. Okay, so here is a story not about meditation as such, but about Buddhist 
scriptures, are the Jataka stories truly Buddhist stories or do they predate the Buddhist era? Where do they come from? When did they appear in the world? Were they oral universal stories then adapted to a Buddhist theme? Are they part of the Buddhist canon? Thank you. Okay, so that's a somewhat complicated question. Anybody who's interested in uh, such matters may well be interested to know that uh, I'm planning to put together a course on uh, early Buddhism, which myself and Ajahn Brahmali are planning to present here, uh, I think starting from February. So the details of that course will be made available uh, soon. Uh, and so if you're interested to look uh, and more in the, at the Buddhist scriptures and at the evolution of Buddhism in history, and especially at what we know about uh, the earliest Buddhism that was taught by the Buddha himself and how we know that, and if you're interested in those questions, then uh, sign up for the Buddhist uh, early Buddhism course. But briefly on this particular question, uh, the Jataka stories, which are the stories of the Buddha's past lives, and... Uh, Almost all of them uh, are later additions to the Buddhist canon. There may be a few cases where the Buddha himself talked about his past lives, but if there are, there's very, very few of them. And I actually did a blog post on that some uh, about a month ago now. So if you're interested, you can have a look at that or what I think may be the earliest one of the Jataka stories. Uh, many of the Jatakas indeed predate the time of the Buddha, uh, and this is something which is uh, very firmly established by uh, an understanding of the social and, and political history of the era. And most, ma many of the Jataka stories, in fact, relate to political and social conditions which had already disappeared by the time of the Buddha. And so they're actually pre-Buddhist stories which got picked up at some time in the Buddhist tradition and adapted to become part of the Buddhist canon. Uh, by the uh, literary device of uh, making the hero of the story into the Buddha in his past lives. Uh, so they, it's difficult to trace the origin of most of the Jatakas. Uh, most of them would have just been part of the floating mass of oral literature and folk tales. There are some of them which have uh, common origins with, uh, say, Aesop's fables, so some of them probably transmitted through uh, the trade routes with Greece and so on at the time. Others relate to uh, some of the more ancient uh, Indian mythologies. So you find versions of the story of Krishna and Rama and so on in the Jataka stories. Uh, others uh, seem to be, some, some of them are probably fairly contemporary tales, uh, which relate to conditions and changes uh, as they're happening in the world, uh, while still others uh, are probably... Um, unidentifiable uh, sort of local uh, folk tales passed down. A lot of them, it seems, passed down amongst merchants and travellers. Um, and in terms of their canonicity, yes, they are considered to be part of the Buddhist canon, uh, but the part, they belong to a part of the Buddhist canon which is generally taken by scholars to be um, somewhat later than the